So let's assume that the reason that women are higher in sensitivity to negative emotion is because the world is actually more dangerous to women, right? Because that would be the most logical reason why there would be a sex difference in, a sex difference in something like fear or sensitivity to punishment. Well, first, there's the danger of physical altercation. Second, there's the sexual danger. So women become sexually vulnerable at puberty. And why do I say vulnerable? Well, it's straightforward. It's because the cost of sex for women is way higher than it is for men. Or it certainly has been throughout our evolutionary history. Because if a man has an unwanted sexual encounter, well, then he walks away and maybe he's persecuted by the state or prosecuted by the state for it. But if a woman has an unwanted, unwarranted, or incautious sexual encounter, and she ends up pregnant, then, well, in traditional societies, that's, you're just done. And even in modern societies that are rich, like ours, you're, it's, it's a, I don't have to go into that. It's big trouble. No matter what you do about it, it's big trouble. So being, being more nervous about that makes perfect sense. But then here's the last thing. And I think that women's nervous systems are not adapted to women. I think women's nervous systems are adapted to the mother-infant dyad. And because you are not the same creature when you have an infant. Not at all. You're way more vulnerable. And it's partly because you have to express the vulnerability of the infant and you also have to care for it. Right? So, you think about an infant, especially under nine months. So, let's say, how are you going to be wired up if you're going to optimally care for an infant under nine months? And I'm saying under nine months because women generally do the bulk of childcare for infants who are under nine months old. And part of the reason for that, there's a whole host of reasons, but part of the reasons for that, obviously, is that they breastfeed. But imagine what you need to be wired up biologically in order to care for an infant. First of all, they're very demanding, right? Because they're completely helpless, and they're demanding 24 hours a day. And it's quite, it, it's quite, uh, it's quite a emotional load. And an infant under nine months is never wrong, right? What you do to an infant under nine months is when they're in distress, you always respond. You never tell the infant, get your act together and stop whining, right? Which you can do, say, to, an in, to a child that's 18 months old. You can start having that sort of conversation. But under nine months, it's like nothing is the infant's fault. It's surrounded in an extraordinarily threatening world. And you have to be responsive to what it needs, regardless of what you want. And you have to be very sensitive to the threats that emerge in the environment. And so I think the price that women pay for that ability to have an intimate relationship with infants in the very earliest stages of development is that their nervous systems are actually wired so that they can perform that role optimally. And the disadvantage to that is that having a temperament like that doesn't work that well when you're dealing with adult men, especially when you're dealing with them in a business environment, because it's not the same thing. Not at all. It's a competitive environment. So, okay, so agreeable people are compassionate and polite. What are disagreeable people like? They're tough-minded, they're blunt, they're competitive, and they won't do a damn thing they don't want to do. So it isn't exactly that they're aggressive, although they will push you the hell out of their way if you're in the way. They're not, they're not like volatile like you are if you're high in, in, in neuroticism. It isn't defensive aggression, it's more like predatory aggression. It's dominance behavior. And so for someone who's, high, who's high, highly disagreeable, they look at the world as a place in which they can compete and win. And I'll tell you a story, I have a friend, I gave him my personality test, the big five aspect scale that Colin DeYoung developed huh, in my lab. And uh, I knew he was a disagreeable guy And by interacting with him. Uh, I mean, he's even rude to people sort of spontaneously on the street. I actually like him quite a bit. He's very, very funny. He's also very conscientious, so you can trust him, but he's disagreeable as hell. And uh, so I gave him this test because I thought it would be funny, and he came out as the most disagreeable person in 10,000. So, Reasonably, reasonable in, in compassion, about 30th percentile, but like 0 .001 in politeness. So he's extraordinarily blunt. He'll just say absolutely anything, no matter how horrible it is. And he was often brought into corporations to sort of clean them up. So if a corporation was tilting and not doing well, they'd bring him in to find out who the useless people were and fire them. And I talked to him about that because I've had the miss opportunity to have to not have graduate students in my lab, for example, that weren't performing well, and I'd find it very, very difficult to, you know, dress someone down and certainly difficult to fire them. I just hate it because I'm actually quite an agreeable person, much to my chagrin. 
And I asked him about that, and I said, well, what do you do? You have to fire people all the time. How do you handle that? He says, handle it? I enjoy it. And I thought, wow, that's so interesting that someone would have that response. I said, well, what, what do you mean you enjoy it? He said, look, I go into these companies and I analyze the performance of groups of people, right? And there's in those groups, there are people who are really striving, really trying hard and working themselves really hard and being productive. And then there's these people that are just doing nothing. They're completely in the way. They don't carry their weight at all. They take advantage every chance they get. And they're always whining about why they can't work. It's like, I find out who they are, I call them into my office, and I tell them exactly what they've been doing. It's like, hit the road, buddy. You've had your, you've had your run of it. And I thought, oh yeah, okay, fair enough. You know, well, I, I can tell you, you know, I've had situations in my lab where I had underperforming graduate students. And one of the things that was really awful about that was that it was really hard on the high-performing graduate students. You know, because they felt that even being in the same category as the people who weren't working hard and pulling their weight, devalued what they were doing, you know, and that's exactly right. And so this is also why there's, there's a conscientiousness trait and an agreeableness trait. Because conscientious people judge you on your accomplishments, right? They don't give a damn about your feelings, not a bit. It's like, are you doing the work or not? Whereas agreeable people think, well, you know, your mother's sick and, you know, you've, you've got a bunch of family problems and, and we all have to take care of each other and it's no wonder that you're having a rough time. And, like, you can't say that one of those attitudes is correct and the other isn't correct. You can't say that. There wouldn't be those two dimensions if there wasn't something correct about both of them. But you can certainly point out that often they conflict. You know, and so the demand for, for inclusiveness and unity and care, and the demand for high-level performance in a hierarchical structure, they're very different orientations in the world. And so, it's complicated for people who are agreeable and conscientious. And Actually, I think often that large corporations, large, large institutions of any sort run on the unheralded labor of people who are high in agreeableness and high in conscientiousness, and they're disproportionately women. My experience in large institutions has been that if you want to hire someone to exploit appropriately, no, not appropriately, if you want to hire someone to exploit productively, you hire middle-aged women who are hyper-conscientious and who are agreeable because they'll do everything. They won't take credit for it and they won't complain. And that's nasty. And I think that happens all the time. And so one of the things you have to be careful of if you're agreeable is not to be exploited because you'll line up to be exploited. And I think the reason for that is because you're wired to be exploited by infants. And so that just doesn't work so well in that actual world. And one of the things, one of the things that happens very often in psychotherapy, you know, people come to psychotherapy for multiple reasons. But one of them is they often come because they're too agreeable. And so what they get is so-called assertiveness training. Although it's not exactly assertiveness that's being trained. What it is is the ability to learn how to negotiate on your own behalf. And one of the things I tell agreeable people, especially if they're conscientious, is say what you think. Tell the truth about what you think. There's going to be things you think that you think are nasty and harsh. And they probably are nasty and harsh. But they're also probably true. And you need to bring those up to the forefront and deliver the message. And it's not straightforward at all because agreeable people do not like conflict. Not at all. They smooth the water. You know, and you can see, you can see why that is in accordance with the hypothesis that I've been putting forward. You don't want conflict around infants. It's too damn dangerous. You don't want fights to break out. You don't want anything to disturb the, the relative peace. You know, and if you're also more prone to being hurt physically and perhaps emotionally, you also may be loath to engage in the kind of high intensity conflict that will solve problems in the short term. Because a lot of conflict, it takes a lot of conflict to solve problems in the short term. And you know, if that can spiral up to where it's dangerous, which it can, if it gets uncontrolled, it might be safer in the short term to keep the waters smooth and to not delve into those situations where conflict emerges. The problem with that is it's not a very good medium to long term strategy, right? Because lots, lots of times there are things you have to talk about because they're not going to go away. And so partly what you do with agreeable people is you get them to figure out, and they have a hard time with this too. If you ask a disagreeable person what, what he wants, say, or she wants, they'll tell you right away. They, they know. It's like, this is what I want and this is how I'm going to get it. But agreeable people, especially if they're really agreeable, are so agreeable that they often don't even know what they want because they're so accustomed to living for other people and to finding out what other people want and to trying to make them comfortable and so forth that it's harder for them to find a sense of their own 
desires as they move through life. And that's not, look, there's situations where that's advantageous, but it's certainly not advantageous if you're going to try to uh, forge yourself a career. That just doesn't work at all. So, 